Thanks, Jenny. Um, and um, good morning, everyone. I, I hope those of you that are here in Colorado are comfortable and warm with a nice cup of coffee on uh, such a wintry, high impact weather day. Um, you know, what a difference uh, it makes. Um, two years ago, uh, we would, this meeting would certainly uh, be canceled, but, you know, it's the way we're operating now. Um, I'm really excited to be here to get it today once again. Um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and kick off this meeting that's that's extended to me. Um, and uh, this is a again a long standing a long standing cross um, lab program at NCAR, which really example is an exemplar of, of a project that's uh, real run across NCAR. Um, uh, instead of being lab centric, uh, cross laboratory science is, is really the future of science at NCAR, uh, especially as we continue to be more intentional about doing use inspired research, uh, which we all know is really critically important and, and needed by society. And it's a priority in our, in our strategic plan. So we are very fortunate to have the success of STEP. Uh, to really help us guide, to help guide NCAR into the future of, of more intentional use inspired um, actionable research. Also uh, along those lines, um, STEPS end to end approach in linking basic research in observational science and process understanding, predictability to hydromet prediction uh, associated with high impact wet weather is very much in line um, with this theme of actionable science, which is a priority in our strategic plan. So really, again, um, STEP is helping to lead NCAR to, into the future, you know, given these activities and given this alignment um, with key, key themes that are in the strategic plan. And, and, and this is despite um, you know, its long history uh, typically, people say when there's a program around for that's a long time, it, it tends to, to not be forward looking. But really, um, in truth, um, STEP is really leading us um, into um, really leading NCAR into the, in, into the future. So that's the significance of STEP to NCAR and the research community that we lead and we enable. Um, that's a part of our mission at NCAR. But I don't have to tell anyone here the significance of this work to our broader science and ultimately to society, given the extreme weather events that you know we're experiencing, we're experiencing almost on a weekly basis around uh, the globe. So again, I'm really you know um, really proud to be here and and to have the opportunity to um, start the meeting. Uh, I have an extra special sense of self interest in step this year. Uh, my graduate student, Xiao Jun, is giving a talk tomorrow, and I, I just want to thank, express thanks to Jenny and to Tammy for collaborating um, with us, and it's been very helpful to Xiao Jun. Uh, also, right after me, I believe, uh, Glenn Romine, uh, who's been involved in STEP, uh, but is now in the uh, NCAR director, directorate as senior advisor. Uh, is giving a presentation this morning on stimulating discussion and vision um, for modeling and earth system predictability at NCAR. And so look forward to uh, your feedback um, on that. I also would like to extend ex ex special gratitude to our external keynote speakers, Amy McGovern from University of Oklahoma and Brian Golding from UK Met Office. We're really very excited and very fortunate to have Amy and, and Brian visit with us um, and share the great work that um, they do. Uh, it's great to see this kind of connection with the community uh, and given all the good work that's happening in STEP um, and the need outside NCAR, we really look forward to seeing uh, even greater engagement with the community um, through STEP. Um, and with that, Jenny, um, hopefully I didn't take too much time. I just want to wish um, you a very productive meeting and with very stimulating and um, fruitful discussions um, to come uh, in advancing the work that that's done in step and certainly the, the work that 
at NCAR and um, how we lead and enable the uh, research community. So thanks very much. Thanks again and um, have a great meeting. Thank you so much, Everett, uh, for the encouraging remarks, uh, especially our remarks on the collaborate, uh, you know, cross lab collaboration and our end to end approach. <laughs> we uh, meet step is really a small program, but uh, I think it acts as an example, you know, how we can do this uh, uh, cross lab collaboration. I hope a future in the future we'll have more programs like this. Uh, okay, in the next few minutes, I'll just give a, a very brief introduction of uh, STEP. I think uh, some of you may not know STEP. Mm, okay. Uh, so the name stands for short-term hazard predictability. It used to be short-term explicit prediction. But, uh, in the last year, we feel this uh, would be a better name. Uh, so we have seven project leads, uh, including myself from Rail and MQ, uh, Dave uh, Gauches and uh, Ethan Gutman from Rail, Glenn Roman from the director's office and MQ, uh, Sarah um, Tessendorf from RAIL, Stan Trail from uh, MCube, and uh, Tammy uh, Wackworth from EOL. And each of these seven project leads, uh, is one of the seven projects. Uh, three of them are resides in MCube, three in RAIL, one is in EOL. Uh, and the, the three lab directors from MCube, RAIL, and EOL uh, oversee this uh, program in terms of uh, the direction, you know, and uh, sometimes the, the budget uh, location. Uh, the overarching goal of STEP is to understand and uh, mitigate uh, practical predictability limitations for local scale high impact weather in the context of multi scale interaction of hazard forecasting. Uh, here, short term is referred to zero to 36 hours, but we do have an uh, emphasis on zero to 12 hour uh, prediction uh, up to now. Uh, the high impact weather emphasis uh, include um, heavy rain, flash flood, tornadoes, uh, hail, strong wind, and lightning. Uh, the, the local scale means uh, weather systems that primarily affect a local area, such as county, city, district or town. Um, the step approach is to conduct broad cross uh, uh, lab, lab, laboratory research and development using an integrated approach consistent with the expectation of a national research center. And there are four research um, areas in step to support the overarching goal. Uh, research area one is optimal design and uh, utilization of observations. Two, multi scale data simulation utilizing high resolution observations. Three, convection permitting modeling and ensemble prediction. And uh, four, atoms atmosphere land uh, coupling to improve rainfall and flood prediction. Uh, so the one of the emphasis in STEP is to develop cross uh, research area and cross lab collaborative activities. And these collaborative activities and the research in these uh, four uh, areas uh, will contribute to development of advanced short-term local scale modeling capabilities and complemented by technology transfer and real-time demonstration, as well as education and outreach. So that is a, a brief introduction of the step. Uh, in the next slide, um, I'm going to just uh, go over these a few logistic uh, items. First of all, this meeting is recorded. Uh, for the presenters, if you don't want uh, your talk to be recorded, please let me know as soon as possible. I also expect uh, the speakers will leave at least three minutes for question and uh, answers. And it is uh, preferable for the audience to ask questions by raising hand at the end of each talk. But if you have uh, comments during the talk, you can 
provided that in chart. Uh, each breakout room has a designated lead to modulate the uh, discussion. Others will be assigned automatically and the discussion questions are in the agenda. Uh, so I, you already, I think all of you have the agenda, um, but I will also provide the link uh, in chat for comments. So yeah, that's all I have. So the first session this morning uh, will be chaired by Dave Gorchus. So I think uh, now I can hand it over to him. Oh, stop sharing. Oops, sorry, Jenny, I'm trying to pull up the agenda. Would you mind pulling it up on your end real quick since you already shared? Oh, okay. Okay. Let's see my it's here. Step. Okay, I'll share. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. So yeah, there's there's several good talks that uh, that are planned for this morning. Uh, the first one is kind of a combination keynote and step community talk because uh, Glenn's been working with the step program for quite some time. But uh, as Jenny just said, he's moved over to provide uh, more advisory capacity directly to the director's office. So um, <clears throat> we're going to start with him at nine o'clock here. And then Andres is going to come in and talk about a number of different efforts going on with convective permitting climate modeling. There's some exciting, very long-term runs, kind of groundbreaking in terms of the duration of convective permitting long-term runs that have uh, recently been executed. And then we'll wrap up the morning session with uh, Bill talking, Bill Scamarock talking about uh, impasse uh, evolution and uh, where the status of SEMA sits these days. Um, so with that, Glenn, I think you're up and we'll get you the 30 minute clock rolling. And we're actually a couple minutes ahead of schedule right now. All right, thanks, Dave. Let me get my talk up here. All right, does that look okay to everyone? Yep, looks good. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, Dave, again. And Jenny, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to come in and, and provide this, uh, this talk. Uh, I only have my na own name list on there. So if you don't like things that I say, just blame me. Uh, don't, <laughs> don't blame leadership. But note that uh, a lot of the, the true value here comes from the community and, and from uh, the leadership perspective. Um, but I didn't want to tag them in here in case uh, you know, the views here seem controversial in some way. Um, so th this is really going to start at kind of the, the 60,000 foot level, um, since this is the opening talk for, for the STEP workshop. And then we'll kind of descend down into where uh, STEP resides within this broader frame. Okay, so in terms of motivation, so Earth system science, uh, area has been an incredibly hot topic really um this maybe is something precipitating out of the pandemic people are at home they have a lot of free time to to do writing i don't know uh, but there's just been this uh, incredible wave of guidance uh on earth system science that has uh, been emerging from the community uh and it's clearly become a national priority if you for instance listen to uh, any news lately, climate equity is a, is a top priority of the, of the administration, as well as improving equity and representation. Uh, these are core goals that are not just within our community, but really across the, the nation. And so with this in mind, we can take a look, for instance, at the uh, Next Generation Earth System Science at the National Science, Science Foundation. Uh, this was a National Academy study that came out. And if we just look at some of the, the specific characteristics that, that were identified in this study, uh, you know, there's curiosity-driven and use-inspired basic research of Earth systems, uh, ensuring diverse, inclusive, and equitable approaches to Earth system science, using observational and computational modeling capabilities, facilitating convergence, 
prioritization of engagement and partnership with stakeholders and educating and supporting a workforce. These should sound pretty familiar because if you've spent time looking at our own NCAR strategic plan and you look at our uh, seven strategic goals, you'll see that there's uh, quite a bit of overlap. And in fact, uh, this maps out quite well. Uh, and so really this idea of both uh, curiosity-driven use-inspired research, developing equitable solutions with the community, fusion of observation and computational modeling capabilities, applying convergent research, developing solutions across disciplinary boundaries, and using utilizing partnerships and engaging stakeholders, these all map quite well. And so uh, this is perhaps a complement to, to the great work that went into developing our NCAR strategic plan, uh, that it happens to be very well aligned with uh, what broader sectors of the community uh, feel are important criteria for us to consider in this problem space. Of course, this isn't the only report that's come out. Uh, NOAA recently came out with their uh, priorities for weather research from their NOAA Science Advisory Board. Uh, our own Everett Joseph is a member of that board, so perhaps it's not too surprising that he got in some elements here that, that happen to align quite well with uh, NCAR foci. Uh, but again, if we take a look at what's here, there's an emphasis on addressing Earth system modeling across time and space scales, identifying and addressing gaps in observational coverage, uh, investment in data simulation methods, especially to utilize existing observations, but also to improve forecast performance, the need for more robust approaches to capture extreme events and to ensure prediction of extreme events are reliable, and developing thoughtful and specifically tailored guidance toward traditionally underserved communities who often bear the brunt of climate and weather impact inequities. So we see these suggestions as strongly aligning with our own emerging ideas, for example, in areas of Earth system predictability, convergent research and hubs. And I'll be going into more detail on those uh, here shortly. Yet another uh, rich source of guidance that's emerged from the community is from the uh, Office of, of Science and Technology who issued a report back in 2020. Uh, this followed from a, a National Academies workshop, which uh, a number of NCAR uh, staff members participated in. Um, and their guidance also suggests focusing on expanding theoretical understanding of the Earth system predictability space, addressing gaps in knowledge, such as through field campaigns, again, convergent research approaches to science challenges, systems engineering approaches to model system design, better utilizing observations along with defining new observing networks needed to address specific challenge areas, and finally, to move our modeling capability forward through coordination and collaboration across agencies. And so this particular report, you can see at the bottom there, that it's, it's a very multi-agency report and uh, provides a, a lot of uh, high level guidance from the community that suggests that uh, moving a lot of these priorities together is gonna require us working together in a, in a more uh, cohesive fashion than perhaps we've done in the past. Okay, so we started looking at all of this uh, content from these various studies. We also had the uh, National Science Foundation uh, site visit team that uh, came uh, last spring, which many of you are probably uh, familiar with or perhaps participated in. Uh, and then we've also had some uh, internal discussions where we're trying to uh, think about all of this community guidance. And then of course, how does this map out onto our own strategic plan and our implementation plan, and how can we basically start to address some of these uh, concepts and ideas that, that align. And so some specific approaches uh, have emerged from this, and that includes focusing model development activities based on requirements to achieve specific science goals. So moving away from, I guess you could say, uh, tool development uh, sort of without a specific application as a prioritization driver. Um, engaging in the problem space of developing solutions for and with society. So that's say we haven't done this in the past, but how can we be an even uh, stronger player in terms of doing this concept of uh, actionable science? Uh, we, we also see uh, opportunities to adapt our modeling ecosystem to address societal challenges at a local scale where implementation of solutions become more feasible. And so through this, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more in terms of our uh, hubs concept. And then adapting our software infrastructure to prepare for next generation computational environments, 
as well as building on our own internal successes while learning from past struggles. And from this, uh, we have identified three core foci for building a framework to address this challenge, where we feel NCAR is well positioned to contribute. This is kind of just an early uh, structure. And so uh, again, we're welcoming input on this as we move it forward, but this is kind of our, our first stab at where we think we might want to go. Okay, so as a first foci, we see Earth system predictability. Uh, this is something obviously pretty close to, to home for us. And this really centers around the idea of uh, process-based studies, understanding intrinsic versus practical predictability among interacting natural systems, as well as capturing the interplay of human and natural systems. Uh, so sort of a, a systems of systems approach where you can span anywhere from curiosity driven to use inspired research. There's also this concept of uh, convergent research. And so, it, and while it, that can mean a number of different things, one way to perhaps uh, interpret this is uh, a means of facilitating partnership with other knowledge disciplines to where we're basically working together in the co-development of solutions with stakeholders. And by building interdisciplinary teams that span the earth sciences and related communities, such as computational engineering, human and behavioral sciences, we can support a community practice across a portfolio of different application spaces. Finally, we see regional hubs as an essential link to connect with stakeholders at local level with scientific expertise brought to bear in the co-development of solutions that can be implemented at a local level, but also to gain direct feedback from stakeholders to identify key processes and uncertainty quantification information that is needed to engender trustworthy and usable information for decision-making. This is not an entirely new idea. If you uh, look through our NCAR strategic plan, uh, you'll find that hubs was something that we included in it. But here we're starting to try to uh, think a bit more about uh, what hubs would actually uh, look like and mean for us. And finally, we really see this uh, coming, uh, coming together as a uh, cohesive system. So sort of uh, a coordinated approach, but really to, to meet societal needs uh, we're going to have to see all three of these uh, topic areas kind of co-developed and, and coordinated across them all uh, in order to really be able to generate the types of uh, solutions that our uh, community is, is demanding. Okay, so now I want to kind of uh, dig in just a bit more on each of these uh, three different topic areas. So first off, uh, if we take a look at the regional hubs area, Again, we, we've looked before at the National Academy uh, study six characteristics. So we see those uh, strongly aligning with the concept of hubs, where it's integrating curiosity-driven use-inspired research, uh, co-developing solutions with the community and stakeholders, and employing a convergent approach. So we envision a role for NCAR also to aid in this process to provide equitable participation of historically underrepresented stakeholders. And we also see essential partner partners toward building equitable and, and just solutions. Next, uh, if we look at uh, convergent research, so we see an opportunity to uh, help bring disciplinary expertise and unique scientific methods and approaches together in the co-development of solutions in partnership with the earth system science community and beyond. Again, this includes engineering, computational and social behavioral scientists, for example, as well as others that uh, may be necessary, depending on the particular space that we're uh, developing solutions for. And we want to make sure that we're engaging the stakeholders to ensure that the solutions that are developed are both trustworthy and actionable. And internally, we see strong interest among our uh, NCAR staff, particularly uh, uh, younger generation of NCAR staff, where they really want to be uh, participatory in convergent research opportunities. And so through facilitation of convergent research with the community and stakeholders, we see opportunity to develop a community of practice and convergent research within NCAR and potentially to, to deliver this capacity to the broader earth system science community. Next, let's uh, dig a little bit deeper into the earth system predictability space. And so again, we can break this down further in, in considering earth system predictability as being a uh, sort of system of sy systems perspective. And so within the systems, we would have both natural and human systems. And if we break down within the natural systems, there, there's a number of different uh, 
systems that exist within that, our focus tends to be on the atmospheric side, not to say that we don't have some expertise in some of these other areas, but specifically within the atmosphere, uh, if you look at one of our uh, uh, cross lab programs in the system for integrated modeling of the atmosphere, uh, they specifically focus in four key uh, areas, which is chemistry, weather, climate, and geospace. And so uh, we see opportunity both to grow from this uh, pilot activity within this small domain space out towards doing true earth system predictability. But the exact domain space that, that potentially could be covered within this is something that we as a community need to uh, talk about and decide just how far we wanna go and what types of uh, activities we wanna do and how integrative we uh, anticipate being. So let's uh, think a bit more about you know, where SEMA came from and, and where it's going. So this is a, sort of a graphic representation of our, what we call the NCAR modeling ecosystem. So it's essentially just a, a graphical representation of the sort of spatial and temporal scales of, that are covered by various modeling solutions that we have within uh, NCAR. And so SEMA is uh, in, in the broadest sense envisioned as an infrastructure that essentially uh, takes a, a collection of, of standalone uh, purpose-driven modeling systems and provides the capability to, for instance, have uh, interoperable and configurable options that, that can span this broader space. And I'd like to dig a little bit further on this to kind of demonstrate uh, why this is a potentially uh, important and valuable approach. So let's start with uh, the community earth system model. Uh, those of you from CGD are, are, are extremely familiar with this, but for those of you who are, are not from that area, it's essentially uh, NCAR's uh, community collaborative uh, earth system modeling framework that, that we have in place that was uh, basically migrated or developed based on uh, climate modeling capacity. And so within that, we could see it has a dynamic core. In particular, this is the spectral element dynamic core within the, the CAM modeling system. Uh, it has an ocean model, which uh, is at, at the moment anyway, pre preferentially the MOM6 uh, model. And then there's other modeling components that cover, for instance, cryosphere, land, um, and, and other components of the Earth system. And then there's a mediator that essentially uh, pulls it all together and enables the uh, exchange of information across the systems. And so SEMA is essentially this uh, structure that wraps around the dynamic core and then separates out the physics. And the benefit to that is it enables for configurable uh, interoperability between different dynamic cores, physics routines, uh, geospace capabilities, and chemistry. And so the, the benefit from doing things like this is uh, exemplified by, for example, the, the Earthworks uh, program. So this is a, a CSU-led uh, NSF-funded program, uh, and uh, this will be talked about more in uh, Bill Scamrock's uh, presentation, which will be following up here in a bit. And that allows basically a reconfiguration of CSM components and infrastructure to uh, tackle new uh, problem spaces. So in this particular case, they're hoping to get down to uh, four kilometers, so cloud permitting. Uh, global resolution, as well as uh, eddy permitting ocean. And this will be uh, an exciting new frontier in terms of uh, modeling uh, capability. And a lot of this uh, comes from this SEMA infrastructure that provides this uh, interoperability and reconnection of components that is essential to, to move uh, science forward in this way. And we see this as, as a nice uh, model and paradigm for how we can look at other modeling systems within the NCAR uh, modeling ecosystem and perhaps uh, take advantage of those in similar ways. Okay, so I'd be remiss not to address this uh, specific challenge uh, of our computational approach. And so one thing that I wanna make clear is that uh, the the high performance computing uh, landscape is, is undergoing kind of a rapid transition. So a lot of the modeling codes that we use uh, in, in earth system science are based on CPU architectures. And so this is just sort of our standard uh, Fortran based uh, codes that all of us are, are very familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, as we look at the, the future in this space, 
that type of architecture is is becoming less and less common. Uh, a lot of the the development and high performance computing is really focused on GPUs, uh, and we are uh, moving a little towards that direction. If you look at our newest uh, computer allocate uh, acquisition in Derecho, which we hope to have on the floor uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, we need to be prepared to run our codes on those new GPU systems as that's going to become uh, increasingly common in the future. Uh, recent uh, Exascale Culture Survey identified that, uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of interest uh, within NCAR staff, uh, as represented in that survey anyway, in moving towards GPU acceleration. And so there's going to be some work to, to be done here to kind of start thinking about how we can get our codes ready for those next generation systems. So what we don't want to find ourselves is having a lot of codes and, and nowhere to run them. And so you can expect to hear more about how we're going to try to uh, evaluate our uh, modeling ecosystem and move that forward in the not too distant future. Okay, another challenge that we're facing is, you know, funding is a, is a challenge. Okay, so if you look at the total uh, direct support to NCAR over the past decade. Uh, one thing you might note is that the trend is pretty flat. So with rising cost of business uh, at about 3% a year, that puts us in a bit of a bind in terms of, you know, how are we going to continue and, and perhaps even do new uh, concepts such as those that were uh, described earlier in this talk. And so one way that we could potentially get at some of that is that we really need to think about partnership um, in terms of how we can move some of these efforts forward. And so that'll definitely be something that uh, you'll be hearing more about in the not too distant future as we start to get more of our uh, partnership infrastructure uh, set up in place to, to move things forward. Okay, now beyond NCAR, we're certainly not the only ones that see this landscape, uh, not even nationally, but, but globally uh, as a rapidly evolving space. Uh, towards doing very high ultra low resolution uh, global simulations. And in particular, you know, how far do you want to go in, down the Earth system modeling rabbit hole? Uh, for instance, including impact models, including human behavior. Uh, these are challenging spaces, uh, and some are not nearly as mature as, say, in atmospheric prediction. Uh, but uh, being bold, there's a number of groups that are starting to look at how they can approach this problem. And so one in particular, which I believe Andy will be talking a bit more about is the uh, Lighthouse Digital Earths approach, where they're looking to design modeling systems that can uh, really get down into a lot of these small scale uh, subcomponent systems uh, resolved at very high resolution. And in particular, bringing data simulation for climate applications. So it, there's a great deal of value in doing so because it allows you to confront your climate predictions with observations and really understand what they do well and what they perhaps don't do so well and where the uncertainties lie. And from those uncertainties, then you know where to focus uh, your observational uh, capabilities to, to improve those modeling systems. And so we'll definitely want to be looking at moving uh, forward and looking, uh, looking at and working with the external community, especially as we consider, for instance, how to move our uh, modeling systems towards exascale applications uh, to meet the future architectures because these are computationally very difficult problems. All right, so let's come back to step and where it fits within this. And so as any uh, discussed, step uh, is long standing across the project. Uh, and it's really done uh, a wonderful job at, at being integrative across the labs and in, in bringing uh, teams together to, to do integrated science. And they're working at a problem space that's particularly challenging uh, in high impact uh, prediction and predictability. Um, and so these elements of partnership that have been uh, exemplified by STEP, I think are, are a great um, platform. And, and in fact, we've used it as sort of an exemplar for looking at how we want to develop other cross lab programs to be successful. And there's a, a an incredible amount of expertise within this team, uh, particularly across convective scale prediction predictability, uh, the uh, coupled modeling of, of convection permitting models with hydrologic models, data simulation, uh, particularly for novel observations, and more recently uh, stepping into uh, AI and machine learning uh, for enhanced prediction. 
starting to look more at uh, hazard and now impact prediction, as well as physical process studies of deep convection. So these are extremely uh, valuable skill sets as we start to, to flip those back to the problem space that we were talking about before. And so I see uh, a, a great deal of opportunity uh, to bring this skill set to earth system science and predictability, such as at the uh, weather and climate interface, uh, prediction of extreme events, tracing sources of model uncertainty and loss of predictability, coupling of modeling systems, and enabling data simulation capability for novel observations. So as a community, these capabilities can be brought to bear on developing more than uh, more just and equitable solutions, improving access to critical information that enables decision making. And lastly, as a community, we need, we'll need to work together to prepare our codes for next generation uh, high performance computing environments. And uh, with that, I will conclude my talk and, and welcome any questions. And I uh, thank you all for your attention. Great, thanks a lot, Glenn. I think that was a really nice sort of architectural discussion on where things are gonna be headed and uh, interfacing with a lot of the other larger scale programs outside of our organization. We do have a few um, comments, questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start with those. And then if other folks want to raise your hand, uh, please feel free to do that and we'll move through those. So the first question is from Brian Golding. Um, and uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and read your question out uh, as you'd like to hear it? Okay, yeah, I, I was just interested in, in a strategic statement that you were looking to get rid of um, cumulus parameterization at, at a four kilometer resolution. While that's what uh, convective scale models have tended to do, uh, there is an increasing realization, I think, in the community that uh, there's quite a lot of cumulus um, uh, fluxes which can't be captured at grid scale at four kilometers or even at one kilometer. And that therefore the, the strategic goal should be a scale aware uh, parameterization. To some extent, that's also true of gravity wave drag, although less so probably for, for uh, that, that tails off at a slightly higher scale. So I, I'm interested to, to know what the, um, what the argument is there. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, so definitely good questions. And you know, I'm gonna start off immediately by saying that that's related to the Earthworks program and their choices. And it's not, that's not my science. That's not my, my choices there. Uh, I do think it's a good argument. Um, and I'm familiar with some of those studies that especially for shallow cumulus, that there is uh, potentially a benefit to keeping um, those schemes running, uh, that those aren't always as well captured. Um, and there's something to be said for the fact that cumulus parameterizations have been around for a long time and they've, they're very uh, well-tuned systems. Uh, they have good climatologies because they, people have been working on them longer. That said, uh, especially for deep convection, uh, explicitly uh, resolving those scales is, is probably stronger four kilometers is kind of uh, marginal and depends a lot on the specific dynamic core um, and, and how diffusive it is as to whether that's an adequate resolution to really get things um, as nicely done as you would like them. But you also have to keep in, in balance with that the, uh, the challenges of this being a, a global modeling system. And so uh, it really gets expensive when you start talking about how to, how to resolve this uh, grid spacing even finer than this. But I would say if you have specific questions on, on the, the sort of choices of the physics for this uh, specific study, those would be better directed at uh, Bill Scamrock and he'll be uh, coming up here shortly to give a, a talk. Great, thanks a lot, both of you. Um, Glenn, it looks like we've got one more question from Vonda in the chat, um, Von, uh, I'll go ahead and read this because it's a, a pretty straightforward one. What do you see as the role of observations and also of data simulation in uh, the Earth system science predictability efforts that are articulated? You mentioned it a few times, but maybe you want to dig a little deeper. Sure, uh, thanks Dave and thanks Vonda for the question. So obviously I think observations are, are absolutely vital uh, in this process, particularly as we try to develop new theoretical understanding. Observations have a long history of of being an origin for that. And then of course, it, 
we really want to confront our modeling systems with observations to, to understand what our modeling systems represent well and what they maybe represent not so well and where the uncertainties lie. And a lot of times when we find uh, highly uncertain processes, those uh, that are critical to the uh, to providing guidance in a particular area, those become foci for future field campaigns. And so that's when we want to really bring additional observations to bear to really uh, better understand the, the underlying physical processes to make sure that we can accurately uh, represent and model those. Uh, and so I think they're uh, strongly integrated and absolutely essential. Uh, historically, data simulation has been less prominent um, in climate models. And, uh, you know, I, not only do we see this as a, as a potential opportunity, uh, it's also seen as an opportunity in other programs, such as, for instance, the earlier mentioned uh, Lighthouse program, which wants to go after this space as well. And so we definitely want to see data simulation with our climate modeling, as well as our component modeling capability. And there's a lot to be uh, understood in terms of how to do uh, coupled data simulation. So when you have a fully coupled modeling system, how do you do data simulation within that fully coupled uh, modeling system? Is it best to do it uh, component by component and then figure out how to enable a smooth transition into integration? Or is there value, for example, in uh, doing cross-component data simulation where you move information from one modeling system, say an observation in the atmosphere, uh, into, say, the ocean? Uh, the current thinking is, is probably leaning more towards doing individual components and trying to find ways to, to smoothly integrate forward and create consistency across components. But I'd say that's still a, a, an open science question. Glenn, would you be so bold as to give a priority on uh, what type of observation you'd like to see first and foremost? Um, I would not be so bold. I'm gonna say it depends on your earth system application. And so uh, I think, you know, what's going to be most important will depend on what, um, what, what you're trying to work on. So, for instance, uh, if you take the recent uh, hot topic, if you will, haha, of, uh, of fire, uh, wildfire prediction, uh, you know, what are the most critical observations? Well, you really have to kind of understand more of, you know, where's the problem space in that, in that prediction uh, and what do we have observations of? Um, you could, for instance, say that there's excellent observations of uh, heat signatures that are associated with wildfires that might be useful for getting initiation in the right point place. Uh, and yet those are from polar orbiting satellites. And so you don't see them at, at the time frequency that you need to be uh, actionable. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Didn't mean to put you on this. Actually, I did mean to put you on the spot there. So good <laughs> answer. Um, let's do one more quick uh, qu comment question from Rajesh, uh, which is also in the comment bar here. What types of partnerships do you envision NCAR engaging in the domestic as well as international levels? And are there any recommendations, uh, presumably coming out of the director's office, on how to best coordinate those? Thanks, Rajesh. Uh, another uh, great question. And I, I would say that our partnership strategy is, is still kind of in the early phases. Uh, that in some ways, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward to do partnerships where um, there is multiple agencies in place. So for instance, we can use um, contractual things like memorandums of understanding and, and things of that nature that, that help to kind of uh, bind resources together and commitments to achieve a common goal. It becomes a little more complicated sometimes when you go to the international scale, yet there's uh, a number of uh, clearly interested international partners uh, in working on some of these uh, activities together. And so I think it it's requires basically a lot of legwork, uh, both at a, at a scientist to scientist level, and then also at an organization to organization level. And usually where you run into problems, uh, from what I can see in my you know, limited time in this role, is, is getting the resources together that enables uh, the collaboration of partnership. Often that um, is equally difficult to pull together. But uh, if you have specific ideas or suggestions on partnerships, uh, both for Rajesh and for everyone on this call, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we're in the process of strengthening our strategic partnership uh, team capabilities and business development and government relations across the organization. And so this is an excellent time to come to us with uh, suggestions and ideas. Great, thanks a lot, Glenn. And we're wrapping up right on time, much appreciated. 
Our next speaker is going to be Andres Prine, again, talking about some of the recent developments and evolutions in convective permitting climate modeling. Uh, so getting to some of the issues, or at least a couple of the threads that Glenn just talked about here. Uh, Andy, cool. Looks like you're already booted up there and ready to go. Um, yeah, thanks, Dave. Yep, take it away. Uh, thank you and welcome, everybody. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Um, so this is really a review over a decade of work that's basically spearheaded by the NCAP Water System Program, uh, doing convection permitting climate modeling. And I, I wanted to jump right in. Um, these are the domains that we ran over the last 10 years, uh, really starting over a fairly small region, focused on the Colorado headwater. Um, in 2001, uh, 2011, we started doing this work. And then expanding uh, the scope more and more, looking at the CONUS and then even with most of North America. Now we are already running South America simulations as well. Uh, so most of these simulations are reanalysis driven. Over time, we not even extended the spatial domain, but also the temporal uh, time periods that we downscaled, uh, starting with eight years in Colorado headwaters. Then we did 13 years with CONUS 1, which is this domain here, CONUS 2, had already 20 years. Uh, CONUS 4.4, this is recently finished, now has 40 years of data on also on this domain. And South America will have 20 years and we will be done there soon. Um, so as I said, most of them are reanalysis driven. I focused on those. Um, the exception here is CONUS 2, which is GCM driven. I will show you only one result from this, this simulation. Um, and most of these simulations have future climate projections that I will also not focus on because I thought it's probably more relevant to talk about the reanalysis driven simulations um, to, to this group. Uh, we also have simulations of Alaska and Hawaii that I won't talk about, but I just wanted to mention them. Additionally, there are other efforts at NCAR um, that used convection permitting modeling, uh, climate modeling. For example, there was a project uh, focused on the East African Great Lakes. Uh, Shanghai Liu is currently running WOLF over the maritime continent and looking at MGO and convective propagation and organization. And I'm involved in a project over the Tibetan Plateau. So um, as you can see, we, we span quite a large regime of climate regions, um, and this is exp ex extending con um, continuously. So, but what I wanted to do really is to take you step by step through the development of uh, the model code and the, basically how which simulations were run over time and how we improved them. Starting, as I said, with the Colorado headwater simulations, um, I always put the basic model setup up here. Uh, as you can see, it's quite an old, old world code. It's, it's 10 years old by now, but this was really a benchmark simulation that basically set the cornerstone for the rest of all the simulations that we did, because these simulations were uh, really essential to demonstrate that convection permitting climate modeling on regional scales uh, has high value. And most of these analysis studies that were performed in the headwater simulations were focused on orography and orographic flow and precipitation. Uh, this is just a little movie to show you in the domain that we simulated how the orography is deteriorating if you increase the or decrease the resolution of the model. Um, so you can see you quickly lose a lot of the small scale details that you, you really need to, um, to simulate the flow and precipitation patterns in this region. Um, a key result that I wanted to highlight from Rasmussen et al. 2014, what you see here is the accumulated rainfall of precipitation during uh, one uh, season, starting in November till May, uh, from snow tail sites. So these are um, observations, stations that we have in, in the Rockies and across the Western US that measure precipitation and snow really um, very accurately. And these are in locations which, which have the maximum snowpack. So these are mostly in the slopes um, between 3,000 and 4,000 meters. And uh, this is compared to PRISM, what you can see here, the points is PRISM. If you want to capture this accumulation with a 36 kilometer wolf simulation, you will highly underestimate the precipitation on these points. And you really have to go to higher resolution to capture those. So with 18 kilometers, you're getting closer. And with six and two kilometers, as you can see here, you're getting very close in reproducing what the observations show. This is um, like the forcing that we used here is the North American regional reanalysis. So you, as you can see, if you go to this kilometer scales, you have a, a highly improved representation of orographic precipitation, but also snowpack dynamics. So the buildup and the melt off of snowpack is highly improved. Um, this is major benefits, of course, for hydrologic, hydrologic studies, snow studies, and glacier modeling, for example. 
for example. So build on, uh, based on this, the, the success of these simulations, we uh, went on and extended the domain to the CONUS domain. The simulations, we called them CONUS 1. Uh, these were performed in, or finished in 2014. And we changed the physics a little bit. We changed to the NOAMP uh, micro, um, NOAMP land surface scheme, mainly because it has a multi-layer snow, snow physics scheme, which is very essential to capture the refreezing of water in the snowpack. This is really important in the Pacific Northwest um, region to cap capture snowpack dynamics. We also changed the Thompson scheme to the aerosol aware, the ROTMG scheme, which had slightly better performance uh, when used. So um, staying with orography first, um, this is a, um, a recent study that was published last year by Kyoko Ikeda. What she and, and her co-authors looked at were the cross barrier jets. Um, and this is an observational result here from 1982, where they flew air aircraft in the Sierra Nevadas and basically showed that there's this cross barrier jet where you have high uh, wind speeds along the, the Sierra Nevadas, um, along this, the slopes of the hills. And basically this is exactly what we find in this, in this CONUS-1 simulations with four kilometers grid spacing as well. So it's, it's a very, like it, it, this, this is a very nice result. I think um, you can also see this here in like this, Cross section is, is up here that's shown here, but you can see this along the, um, the Sierras, you have this cross barrier jet, and then in parts you have these gaps in the mountains where the, where the flow is allowed to go through uh, the gaps. And this is basically um, then producing this, this pattern of, of precipitation and also snowpack that we observe. So a really nice process study here. I really encourage you to look at that. Um, but the simulations not only have big benefits in, in wintertime and orography, but also in summertime and convection. So, I wanted to highlight the general cycle of convective precipitation here. Um, the black line down here is co-op stations in the Western US shown here during June, July, August. And the colored lines are, is, a, is a physics ensemble uh, of 36 kilometer wolf simulations. And we tested multiple physics here. The dominant sensitivity was to the, micro, uh, to the cumulus scheme um, as, as probably not surprising to you. So if you change from Cambridge to Tietke, you can see that the general cycle changes quite a bit or NSAS. But the, the point here is all of them are fairly wrong and fairly far away from the observations. So no matter what you do with the, mic with the convection scheme, you don't get very close to the observations. You always have an early peak and way too much an, an overestimation of the amplitude. And this is really a combined error that you see here. This is an area of the frequency. We have way too frequent rainfall especially during the day in these in this runs. And the intensity of rainfall is way too low. Um, so this is really uh, one of the key things that the water system program uh, tried to resolve to improve the, the simulation of the frequency intensity and the amount of precipitation, including the phase of precipitation. And the CONUS-1 simulation, you can see this, this, it's improving the situation dramatically. So we, we really capture the precipitation way better. This is just showing you this for the Western US, but it's the same thing for the Eastern US as well. So moving on from the CONUS-1, uh, we uh, ran CONUS-2, which I said before, this was a um, different forcing data set. We used um, the CSM climate model data to force the simulations. Um, like we updated the model version and we included groundwater. And this was a really essential um, improvement in the model code and I will show you in a second why. And the same thing we also included in the CONUS 4.4 simulations, which are basically flex flagship simulations that we finished recently, which are 40 year simulation stone scaling era five from 1979 till pr basically present. And I wanted to, to compare those three simulations with each other. Uh, basically, in their performance of simulating the frequency of MCS of, of mesoscale convective systems in the central US. So this is showing you stage four observations. If you track MCSs in stage four, you can see you have a high frequency of MCSs in June, July, August, and of course, very low frequency in, in winter time. Uh, the CONUS-1 simulation did a pretty good job in capturing MCS frequencies up to June. And then in the second half of summer, um, we really underestimated the the number of, of MCS is quite dramatically. It took us several years to find out what the dominant uh, problem or processes that caused this, this um, drop in MCS frequencies. And it turned out that that's related to land surface atmosphere coupling. So without a groundwater scheme, um, 
you get a very strong warm bias in the central US. This is something that you see almost in all climate models. Um, they, they all have very, very warm temperatures in the central US. And you can see up here, up to five to six degrees to warm temperatures. And this is from a study by Balazs et al. 2001, which I really encourage you to look at. It's, it's, it's a really interesting study. Um, and when you inc include groundwater in the NOAA MP code, so basically you, you allow the lateral flow of groundwater, you, you resolve most of these biases. So you, you almost, you're almost bias-free. And what this causes is, is a, a dramatic improvement of the MCS frequency. Of course, this, those two are coupled because MCS and pre precipitation is cooling down the central US. And you can see we, we nicely capture the, the fall period MCS frequency now with CONUS 4.4 and even with the CONUS 2, which is, dry, with, which is driven by GCM, which basically has no idea of any MCSs in the, in the late summer season. And the, and, and the CONUS 2, a wharf in four kilometer can really capture the MCS climatology very well if you, if you use a groundwater scheme. What's also shown here is a 12 kilometer simulation with um, using the kind fridge deep convection scheme. And you can see that even at 12 kilometers uh, with a groundwater scheme, you're not able to capture the MCS frequencies. And this has man multiple reasons. I can talk about this later if, if you're interested. But four kilometers is giving you a really good representation of the climatological frequency of MCSs. Um, talking a little bit more about CONUS 4.4, this is a major uh, collaboration between the US, USGS and NCAR um, that started two years ago. And I think this is the revolutionary thing about CONUS 4.4 is really it allows you to look at mesoscale processes across the climatological time period. So for example, we looked at the MCS frequency in the central US and you can see like from here from 1980 to 2020, how many MCS have we observed, how many were simulated and how much the simulation improved MCS frequencies compared to the driving data, which is era five. But it's like CONUS 404 and the USGS collaboration are, are, is way more than that. It's, it's really integrating or using the CONUS 404 data set to drive um, hydrologic models, uh, focusing on water quality, water um, quantity um, from the bedrock up to the cloud top. And it's really to develop an ecosystem of models that can model each of these components in the water system um, as, as good as possible. So um, the last thing that I wanted to highlight is the South America uh, simulations that we are doing currently. So this is again, using a very similar setup. And what I wanted to convey with this slide is really that we, we built the simulations on a decade of experience. So we really tried to improve the model from, uh, from version to version of these simulations. And this is the first time we applied outside of North America. And the, the simulation results are very encouraging um, as I will show you in a second. Um, we do the simulations within the South American Affinity Group. Um, we, we established this group approximately two years ago, and the members in the group steadily increased over time. So this is an open group. Everybody who, who is interested, and I know some of you are already members in, in the SAC community. We have more than 100 uh, members now from a very diverse um, group of people from North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And what we do there, the flagship simulations here are definitely the WOLF simulations, a 20-year simulation downscaling era five, very similar to what we do in North America with the CONUS 4.4 uh, from 2000 to 2020. We are halfway through. So there's a lot of data already available that, that people could look at. But we will also have uh, simulations by the SEMA model, or by uh, basically the CAM model. Um, and the, there will be a six kilometer high resolution mesh over South America. And we compare, can compare WOLF with SEMA directly here, which I think is very exciting. I think this is more studies like that are needed to really understand how these two different modeling systems are performing compared to each other. And I think it will also um, simplify uh, the transition if we want to move over to SEMA in the future at some point. And then we also have simulations from the UK Met Office with the unified model that we can compare to. So this is a nice data set that we can look at the quality of the different models and compare them to each other. Um, just a quick result from the, the, the SAC simulations over South America. Um, this is one of the primary cases, MCS cases that were observed during the Cacti Relampago field campaign. You can see this in the observations here. And it was extremely well simulated by the WOLF model. And we see this pretty consistently that WOLF had, does a really good job in capturing MCSs, not only in Argentina, but also in the, in the Amazon basin, which, which is very encouraging because we use very similar model settings. 
um, compared to North America, and they seem to work very well in South America as well. Um, so two things to mention, this, these simulations will cover the GoAmazon campaign and the Relampago field campaign. So I think there are definitely collaboration opportunities here to work with, with the STEP program together if you're interested to look to use these data sets to do detailed process studies. So this is where we are, 10 years of, of research. Uh, the question is what's next? Uh, what I really wanted to highlight here to stress is that these improvements were really driven by improve, improvements in the cap computational capabilities at NCAR. Uh, the, the headwater simulations were run on Bluefire. Uh, Yellowstone en enabled us to go to continental scales to do the CONUS simulations. Uh, Cheyenne, now we are running CONUS 4.4, longer periods, CONUS, uh, CONUS 2 and, and the SAC simulation. CONUS 4.4 is actually run on a USGS system called Denali. But I think we really should look ahead and think about what can we do on the ratio. So there is a large increase in computational resources coming our way, 3.5 times the throughput that we have on Cheyenne at the moment. And as Glenn already said, there are 20% GPUs that we can use here. I think there's a really a good opportunity to think about new scientific adventures that we want to uh, tackle and also to port our codes to GPU. So in the water system program, I think like two, two um, things will definitely continue. This is already sure uh, the CONUS 4.4 effort with USGS. We will run future climate scenarios, but also high resolution basin scale simulations focused on the Colorado, upper Colorado, the Delaware River Basin and the Illinois River Basin. So this will be very high resolution one kilometer simulations. And I think there are also collaboration opportunities here. Um, we will consistently improve the CONUS hindcast. So we will redo CONUS 4.4 somewhere in the future with an improved model setting. And then basically we will redo the future scenarios in the basin scale simulations as well. In South America, we will perform future simulations and also do high resolution simulations on subdomains. So collaboration opportunities, I think what we can do, and this is partly already what, what's happening, but I think they could be strengthened uh, to, especially in those three areas, we could improve our understanding of simulating deep convective systems and associated hazards. I think this is a common theme between the water system program and STEP. Um, and of course, coupled hydrosphere atmosphere modeling. So we, we in, especially in the CONUS 4.4, we have a focus on hydrologic modeling. So I think there's a natural connection there as well. Um, specifically for this improved CONUS hindcasts, I think we, we could think about a North American mesoscale reanalysis. I think this would be really exciting to use um, data simulation to improve the simulation, get it closer to observations. I wanted to mention there's a workshop coming up. I think many of you probably are aware of that. Uh, that's focused on regional reanalysis systems in May in Boulder. Uh, the link is in here and I hope the slides will be shared later on with you. But like the fourth opportunity that, I, that I'm most excited about is uh, global climate, kilometer scale climate modeling. This is already what, what Glenn talked about. And I think there are several uh, key topics that we could work together. First of all, building expertise and using MPES and SEMA, especially like I think both of our communities um, can should speed up on these kind of models and try to test if we can transit to them in the near future. Speeding up the model code will be really essential. Uh, this comes back to maybe using the model code on GPUs. Approximately, we need approximately 20 times speed up to run a global simulation, the same speed we did CONUS 4.4. So three times five um, uh, larger computational capabilities on, on the ratio will be not enough. We will have to work on the model code. And I wanted to highlight that there is an ASD pro, a pro, a project that's coming up where we will um, develop or test the GPU version of MPAS on the ratio. So there will be a compiled code on the ratio where you can run MPAS on GPUs. And I think also improving and speeding up the model physics is one of the key topics. Uh, also making them available through GPUs, for example. Um, novel approaches to data storing and sharing. This is one of the key issues or key challenges that we are facing. And I can imagine STEP is chasing, chasing a step is facing those as well. And then novel approaches to model analysis, um, especially, especially model object-based model analysis and machine learning. And I think there's like, we will talk about this later today. I wanted to end with a, with a quote, uh, never, never let something important become urgent. Um, I think con convection permitting global Earth system modeling is really important um, and we should get going. I think we get it going, but I think we could do a better job in, in speeding up. Uh, many modeling 
centers around the globe have efforts that already work in this field, including NCAR and Glenn already mentioned this WCAP Digital Earth Lighthouse activity, uh, which is really pushing this, this effort forward. I think NCAR has a golden opportunity to be a community leader here. And I think uh, we should really try to establish NCAR as a hub for convection permitting earth system modeling in the future. So uh, thank you for your attention and I hope I have some minutes for questions left. Great, thanks Andres, much appreciated. Um, definitely a nice body of work that's emerged from, from uh, the, the group there. Um, let's see, we've got, we'll take a couple minutes. We've got a half hour break coming up, um, but uh, we'll try and move quickly here. So Morris has posted a question in the chat that relates to, um, while the three to four kilometer simulations uh, resolutions have been good for mid-latitude convection and the kind of organized features that you talked about, for tropical ocean convection, uh, where sort of that lower atmospheric fine scale structures are, are much more important. Uh, what thoughts do you have on addressing some of those challenges? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Morris. Um, what's, what's encouraging is that at least for tropical land, like the Amazon basin, four kilometers seems to work really well. Um, we didn't do a lot of simulations over the tropical ocean, like Shanghai, I mentioned the, the MGO simulations that he is doing over um, over the maritime continent, but I definitely agree this should be one of the focus areas in the future. And I think this is another good opportunity co to collaborate to, to, to work on tropical ocean convection. Great. Uh, let's do Tim's question. You got your hand up, Tim, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I, th I think briefly, and maybe you can comment a little bit more, um, Andreas. Um, but so first of all, that was a really nice presentation. Thanks. It, it covered a lot of ground. I think one of the opportunities uh, embedded in your presentation, you know, we have several of these um, sort of continental scale projects now going on. Um, and we can learn a lot by looking, for example, at South America, and North America. And I just wanted to point out that GWEX has, um, this collection of projects called regional hydroclimate projects. Uh, and we're trying to get one established in the, um, nor in North, in the US. There's one currently going on in Canada called Global Water Futures. There's one going on in, in Andex. So I think there's great opportunities. And earlier this week, Andreas and I and several others in the community had a conversation about how we bridge these RHPs with the lighthouse activities. So I just wanted to point that out and, and if folks are interested, reach out to us. Um, the other thing I'll say is, I, I think one of the great opportunities here, and you touched on this, Andreas, is the linkage to sort of the land surface processes. Um, I know this is a little more of an atmospheric focus, but obviously the, the land is the lower boundary condition for the atmosphere. And there was a great discussion this morning, a couple going on in the, the SUNY map group about biases in, in the forecast and in numerical weather prediction caused by um, issues with the land surface. I think there's a tremendous opportunity here to do that sort of interdisciplinary science. And maybe you could just comment briefly. That was a little bit long-winded on my part. Yeah, well, thank you, Tim. And yeah, thanks for mentioning the RHP. Uh, I wanted to fit it in and uh, I ran out of time. Um, like I fully agree with the land surface atmospheric coupling. I would say like over the last 10 years, most like the major model biases that we corrected were all somehow related to land atmosphere coupling. So this is an enormous and important topic, um, especially if, like on, on the climatological timescales, but as you also said on, on um, forecast timescales, if you have to initialize your sort of land surface. So yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Great. Uh, we'll need to move on. Thanks, Andres. I think we could pick up that thread and go a long way with it if we had uh, an infinite amount of time. Um, let's see, uh, Jean-Francois, yeah, Andres, uh, Jean-Francois posted a comment. If you want to address that in the chat, that would be great. Uh, we're going to move on, though, and Bill Skamarok is up next talking about some of the developments with uh, Impasse and SEMA. Bill, looks like you're loading up there. I am loading up here and should have this on in a second. Yep. Are you, yes, you should be. 
You're probably not seeing the right screen. Hold on. Yep, we're seeing the double pane. Uh, showing up on my other monitor. Hold on here. Okay. Let's get rid of this. And... Let me just shut that off and see if this will work now. Okay. Ah, dang it. I'm sorry about that. Bill, if you just click on swap displays, that might work. Uh, I'm is, sorry? There is, a, there is a button called swap displays when you go to the full screen mode okay. on the top. No. Bill, you just need to go back to the presenters presentation that you were doing, and then swap okay. display will show up. Presentation and swap display. Yeah, just go to slideshow. Here we go. And then and just present. I can play from start. Play from start. The first button on the left. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. No, and, and then now, on the top left, top left, see swap top displays. Left. Got it, got it. Jeez, thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Matt. Yep, take it away. All right, so um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak about MPAS and SEMA. And I think this is a particularly good time because we're at the stage where we're actually testing in some preliminary applications, MPAS and SEMA, and pushing it down to convection permitting resolutions. So in past years, when we said it was close, well, it was kind of close, but now it really is. And I expect uh, we're going to be releasing it in experimental mode in the near future. So the timing is good and you'll perhaps I'll be able to get your hands on it in somewhere this year. So I'm just gonna cover a few things in this short talk. First, why SEMA? Just to give you a little background for those of you who maybe have not been following SEMA. And then I'll talk about impact and SEMA. Essentially, we're trying to do ex explicit convection in, a, in an earth system model. Uh, just briefly review a little bit about computational performance to, to show you that it's running reasonably well. Uh, send some preliminary test results to show you that it's actually working at convective scales, it looks like. And then uh, conclude with some next steps. So first, why SEMA and probably the Best way to answer that is to point you to the SEMA vision. And there's actually a SEMA web page that's hosted by, by UCAR. You can go and see it. And we've had a, we had a community meeting back in 2020. And out of that uh, came a, a vision statement, which I think sums up uh, why, we're, why we're involved in this and why we've been working on this for the last uh, four or five years. And, and essentially, it's we want to bring together the atmospheric modeling at NCAR, the community atmospheric modeling, and put it inside of an Earth system model. And there are a lot of benefits for that. From the weather side now, we'll have access to a full Earth system model to do our work. But also, it will bring a, a bigger community to be working within the same system, looking at uh, similar components. So, and we'll also be able to share uh, the development and support to the community of those components and the infrastructure that it involves, that's involved in it. So that really is what, what's motivated uh, SEMA now from the start. And if you look at what it actually means in terms of a system, well, SEMA is the atmospheric component and it's sitting inside of CEFM. So that's the, the inner box here that's labeled SEMA. What it gets us is it gets us a coupling to the other components. And in particular, it gets us coupling to uh, an ocean, land, ice, and everything else that comes within the CES system. So I, I think this is a very important thing to have. Um, and, and it's the next step, because if you look at a lot of what we do in weather, which is what, what STEP is mostly concerned with as weather phenomena, we really need to be able to move that into a full earth system model and take advantage of everything else that we have in our modeling systems here at NCAR. So that's definitely motivating this. Now you can see here with inside of SEMA, we, I'm gonna to talk today about running MPAS inside of SEMA, but there are other dynamical cores uh, of interest to the atmospheric models. There's also 
obviously CAM physics that sits inside of SEMA. And we are going to be bringing in some war physics, but I think I would view this mostly as bringing in physics we need to augment CAM physics potentially as we go to high resolution. So you can't read the war physics bullet there as being bringing in all the war physics. That is just not possible. And so we're looking at bringing in what we need to bring in to allow these applications at convection permitting resolutions. Okay, in terms of what SEMA will allow us to do in terms of new science, well, I think it's pretty easy to understand given that now we have non-hydrostatic capabilities in an Earth system model. We can go and start modeling convection explicitly, be it in the tropics or in the mid-latitudes. We can now start looking much more closely at, at air-sea interactions because within CESM, we have a complex chemistry, all the aerosols, lots of things that we need to have access to to do simulations to address scientific questions we have at, at the convective scales. So I, I think there's a lot of things that motivate SEMA, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to put those to good use uh, very soon. I should also note that there are SEMA is a big project, so it's not just weather in an Earth system model. We're also looking at uh, air quality, uh, deep atmosphere applications going up to essentially five to 600 kilometer model tops for geospace modeling, uh, other, other planets. Uh, and finally, I would mention that with MPAS inside of CAM, that now makes available a regional atmospheric modeling capability inside of CAM, although we have not enabled it yet because there are certain things we need to do, for example, bringing in the boundary conditions as those we would run more for appreciate one needs. Uh, there are certain things that aren't enabled yet, but we anticipate enabling that uh, somewhere down the road. Glenn uh, and others mentioned earthworks. Uh, that's related to SEMA. It, they, they overlap. And Earthworks is a project led by uh, Dave Randall and Jim Hurl up at CSU to effectively bring GPU capability to an Earth system model. And that encompasses MPAS atmosphere, for which there already is a GPU capability. And we're bringing in MPAS ocean, which has a GPU capability. And we're building GPU capability into the CAM physics. Our goal in 2025 is to be able to do essentially half a simulated year per day on, on the state of the art systems at that time at 3.75 kilometer mesh. And all the components will share that, or, that same horizontal mesh. So that's a very, uh, a very ambitious goal that's helping us already, because this project's already in year two, it's helping us already advance other SEMA objectives of making available very high resolution capabilities in CESM. So this is a complementary project that I believe we're, by, at, certainly by the end of it, we're going to be releasing this to the community. And this will be under SEMA, essentially, in terms of ongoing support after that, uh, to allow for hopefully convection permitting scale, climate scale simulations, because we're talking about simulating uh, decades with this ultimately going forward from the end of this project. So now I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with MPAS directly and get a little bit more into details. Uh, there are a lot of people that are involved in this, uh, and only some of them that I've listed here. Uh, these are mostly a few scientists and a lot of the software engineers that have helped us. And to begin with, of course, what we've been simulating is climate scale tests. And here I'm showing you results from Aquaplanet. That's what QPC6, that's the a case inside of a CESM that is. So no land model, uh, specified ocean temperatures. And what you're looking at here on the right-hand side, on the horizontal axis is the number of nodes or the number of processors you're throwing at this problem. And on the vertical axis is the speed of the simulation, the simulation rate, so higher is better. And this is on 120 kilometer mesh. So this is the climate workhorse mesh. And as you can see, MPAS here is in the, the aqua colored upside down triangles. We are right in with all the other dynamical cores running this set of physics in this configuration in terms of the speed. 
all the other dynamic cores are hydrostatic cores. We're non hydrostatic, but you can see there's not any significant penalty in terms of the integration rate in running a non hydrostatic die core at these scales. And it's only when you get to very high processor counts uh, that you see a fall off in the speed of, of MPAS. And the only one that runs really well here at that is the SE core because it's down at the end to a single element per thread. Uh, whereas we're running fairly well, even at 25 columns per thread. And those of you who run WARF realize that once you get below order a few hundred, certainly below a hundred, you expect things to fall off and impasse is still doing fairly well. So we're encouraged by this and we're in the mix with all the other cores in terms of speed. And then if we look at, for example, for applications that will take a lot of scalars, and this is a plot here, for example, chemistry, where you may have many hundreds of species that you're transporting. This is a test for transport. This is using simple physics. This is just a Kessler physics and just increasing the number of scalars that one is transport. Here, uh, lower is better. This is time to solution plotted on the vertical axis versus the number of tracers. And you can see in this particular configuration, uh, MPAS is actually the fastest among all the cores in terms of the new dynamical cores, meaning FB3 and various types of uh, configurations of the SE core. Uh, this may change depending upon how many cores you put on this thing or whatever. But what it's saying is that the transport scheme in MPAS is reasonably efficient and it scales appropriately. So those two results are telling us that computationally, in terms of the implementation of MPAS inside of SEMA, inside of CAM, that it's running properly, scaling properly, and that it's competitive with the other cores in there. That the fact that it's non-hydrostatic is not a significant cost hit in terms of the integrations. So we've also done aquaplanet simulations at higher resolution to see how well it scales and to see how the CESM infrastructure will handle very dense meshes. So what we've done is we've taken that 120 kilometer mesh configuration and run it out here 380 days, as you can see in the, on the top line here. And at day 300, and by day 300, it's spun up uh, from its idealized initial state to its essentially steady aquaplanet state, or quasi-steady. Uh, we go down to 60 kilometers at day 320, we take that 60 kilometer solution and put it on a 30 kilometer mesh and likewise a spin up. We've gotten all the way down to seven and a half kilometers and seven and a half kilometers is about 10.4 million columns in the solution space. So it's a pretty dark dense mesh. Uh, we are now working on trying to integrate at the 3.75 kilometer MPAS mesh, which is a little over 40 million columns. And we're running into memory issues. And actually we ran into memory issues back at 15 kilometers and then again at seven and a half kilometers. And the uh, software engineers have been able to uh, come up with uh, fixes to address those issues. And now we're looking at a few more. So as we push to higher and higher resolution and stress the CESM infrastructure, uh, we're finding issues and we're solving them. So our last step to get to 3.75 kilometers, which is the earthworks configuration we want to run, uh, we're essentially working through those final issues. So in terms of the cost, uh, if you look at the rightmost column here and simulated hours per day, we're seeing scaling that's appropriate for, as we increase the mesh uh, density, what we expect to see every time we increase it by a factor of two. And we're also dropping the time step by a factor of two and everything. So everything is scaling appropriately, effector, effectively around a factor of eight every time we double the resolution, have the time step. That's what we're seeing. And now we're working at 3.75 kilometers. Uh, the one thing I wanted to point out here in this particular slide is that uh, running CESM and CAM is significantly more expensive than running in standalone MPAS or WARF. And we're looking at approximately five times more expensive than standalone MPAS of deploying, for example, the mesoscale reference physics suite. And that cost is pretty much bound up with the fact that there's a lot more scalars we're transporting around because we're doing full aerosols and everything else in this configuration, uh, the default configuration for the climate system. Uh, the physics is much more complex and much more involved, so more expensive, and we're running in double precision, whereas the defaults for WARF and MPAS are single precision. And that pretty much accounts for the factor of five 
because we know the dynamic before transport is running at the same integration rates as what we would run in standalone. So, and the results essentially show that we reproduce the, the, the climate uh, that we expect to see in aquaplanet in terms of the uh, precipitation rate, the globally average precipitation rate. And as we go to higher resolution, the uh, convective precipitation from the convection scheme drops off. Uh, if you look at 15 and seven and a half, you'll see they're about the same, but there are, that's because that uh, I was running a different version of seven and a half that had the fixes for the memory, but it had an old version of the deep convection scheme. So don't put any credence in that and being indicative of, of an issue. It's just a different, uh, a different flavor of the, the Zang McFarland deep convection. Uh, and of course, it looks as you'd expect for aquaplanet. The above uh, left is the 120 kilometer mesh the precipital water, and lower right is the seven and a half kilometer. We expect to see a double ITZ in this particular aquaplanet configuration with the broad uh, warm SST at the equator. Uh, and if you narrow down the, that SST, the warm SST at the equator, you get back to a single ITZ. So it's just a, a feature of the particular type of aquaplanet configuration. Um, finally, we actually have been doing um, other tests at convective scale using the CAM6 physics, using variable resolution meshes. And this work has been done primarily by Jingyi Huang, uh, who's come on with us in Earthworks to help us uh, push things along. Um, and essentially it's using a variable resolution MPAS mesh with the three kilometer region centered over the Western US and we're looking at the wet season over the Western US and looking at, for example, precipitation in the mountains. So our simulations are November to March from years uh, 1999 through 2004. Uh, we're initializing with the climate forecast system for analysis, but we're using the CAM6 physics here and CTSM um, and a data ocean and ice. So we're, uh, I'm gonna show you a brief comparison of what that looks like. Uh, and we're going to also compare it with the WARF simulations that Roy and his uh, group published uh, this past year uh, in terms of looking at the precipitation in that, in that region. Uh, this next slide shows that the upper three panels is on the far left, the three kilometer region of MPAS. Uh, the PRISM observation, the four kilometers, the middle panel, WARFs in the right panel. What you should take away from those is that they're all reasonably well comparable. Uh, MPAS with the CAMP6 physics in its current configuration tends to underestimate a little bit the precipitation accumulation over those uh, six month periods average uh, compared to PRISM, whereas WARF tends to over predict a little bit. And if you look at the, at the frequency down below, um, it's consistent with what you're seeing in the pictures above. The takeaway here is that, interestingly enough, the CAMP6 physics is not doing a terrible job, they're comparable. Uh, and this is essentially completely untuned. Um, so uh, it's a very encouraging result, just the fact that the model integrated and was stable and produced uh, results that were in the ballpark with CAMP6 physics. I was not necessarily expecting to see results of this nature at, at this point. Um, so to conclude, uh, MPATH and SEMA, we're, we're running in CAMP CESM, Computational efficiency looks good. Three kilometer simulation uh, that you saw in the, in the last set of slides, they're stable. The CAM6 physics uh, may be viable, meaning that they're stable. And at least uh, we haven't looked at it for deep convection yet. We're starting to do those tests now. Uh, it's, it's producing reasonable results. Uh, as I mentioned, we've run into memory problems with dense meshes. And in terms of going forward, uh, we're continuing to address those. Uh, we're going to start testing deep uh, convection by moving, for example, at 63 kilometer mesh over the central US and looking at springtime uh, forecast. Um, but we're also starting to think about applications. And I think uh, later this spring and summer, we're going to be using other meshes for applications we have with uh, tropical cyclones and convection, air quality, chemistry, et cetera. We also will be producing documentation on how to produce these new configurations because that's what a lot of people want to do. And we've got uh, analysis tools we need to put together and hopefully a release and tutorial. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Bill. Much appreciated. Um, sounds like some very exciting developments on multiple fronts there.
Um, I didn't see any new questions pop up in the chat. And with that, I will encourage people to just raise their hand then if they have a question. I guess I have a question related to uh, land formulation and what you guys have been testing. As I understand, it has been a CTSM-based land model formulation that's been used in a lot of these experiments. Is that correct? And and uh, I guess the other question is looking at multi-scale modeling uh, possibilities. Are you guys looking at being able to sort of run the land on a fully different mesh than the atmosphere? So yes, we're running CTSM. Uh, we anticipate the staying with running the land model on the MPAS mesh. Certainly one of the things we're now currently thinking about is how to initialize that for forecasts on uh, that we want to do with variable resolution meshes that go down to three kilometers. So certainly spinning up the land model and somehow bringing in observations and other analyses into it as an initialization technique is something we're very interested in. In terms of running it on different meshes, we haven't really thought about that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, similar to the atmosphere then there's gonna be some scale aware physics that are active with, as this is on a variable mesh uh, that become into play. Yes, and, and to respond to Brian Golding's question to Glenn, uh, I, I think we're in agreement that we really need to be looking at, at scale aware parameterizations and, and uh, certainly uh, doing away completely with deep convection is, is just the first uh, cut. And really we'd actually like to bring in something that's, uh, that takes into account the fact that we're not really, we're not resolving convective updrafts three, four kilometers, that, that's very obvious. So, so parameterization is still needed, what, but what that parameterization should look like is not obvious. With regard to gravity wave drag, ooh, that's another thing altogether because the vertical meshes that we often use don't vertically resolve the gravity waves up in the stratosphere. And I, so I think we're gonna have to think long and hard about what that gravity wave drag parameterization should be doing when we're actually resolving the topography fairly well. Great. Uh, let me go ahead and say that uh, we are eating into our break. So if people want to take a break, uh, that is totally fine. I've had a couple more questions or comments come up here. And just for the sake of the discussion, I think we'll just go ahead and uh, play these out. Uh, first is a comment in the chat by Glenn uh, with a question. It says, can you comment on the viability of single precision for coupled climate applications from your own perspective, looking at some numerics there, I assume? Well, I, this might be somewhat controversial, but in, in my view that I, I think single precision should work fine, but it's gonna mean you're gonna to need to retune likely some of the parameterizations and you're gonna to have to look at some of the physics parameterizations in terms of issues with them associated with precision, just in your computations. Um, the dynamical cores should be fine. Uh, and if you look at the other centers, and I'm thinking particularly ECMWF and the IFS has been pushing this hard in that uh, precision is potentially, uh, well, um, a false sense of security if you think you're getting something out of that in terms of predictability of the systems, I'd say. Um, but there are certainly numerical aspects of both the parameter, of the parameterizations in particular we need to look at before we, we move to single precision. Um, but it's our intent to do so in Earthworks. Great, thanks. Um, Andres, we'll wrap up with you. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, I had a question concerning the Earthworks, like a decade-long simulation at four kilometers. What, what is your data management strategy there? Because like saving model output will be challenging, especially, I guess you will want to save high resolution data, isn't it, like temporally? Yeah, well, well, at this point, I think you want to compute as many diagnostics as you do the simulation as you can. And then you're gonna to have to go back and redo parts of the simulation. So what we save is we save checkpoints, or restart files, and you go back and do it because going into this new era, storage is expensive. Integration is not so expensive. So, so, so I think that's what we're looking at, but this is a problem that we're, we're quite a ways off from addressing at this point. We, we, we have the same issues. So I think maybe we can have yeah. some follow on to start discussions there. All right. Thanks again, Bill. Much appreciated. Thanks to all of our speakers for this morning. 
And uh, we'll take a break here until what ends up being 1030, if I'm not mistaken. And we will start back then with a, a set of talks on, uh, well, basically unified DA from Chris Snyder, as well as some additional impasse discussions from Jiming. So we'll see everybody back here at 1030. Thanks a lot. Here. Thank you. Just so everybody knows, we're now being recorded again. So uh, let me go ahead and flash up the agenda here. There we go. Yeah, so we're coming in out of the morning break. Um, and right now we've got two talks that we'll be going into in uh, the next uh, about 45 minutes or so. And then we're going to, at 11.10, be moving into a set of breakout group discussions. I wanted to go ahead and show everybody uh, the questions that we'll all be contemplating and discussing when we go into the breakouts. Uh, they're certainly relevant and built from the talks that we had this morning, uh, but we'd like to get some further discussion going on these and help to guide the overall step strategy, uh, building on what Jenny uh, built, uh, presented this morning. So uh, question number one for consideration during the breakout is what are the requirements for high impact weather prediction, modeling and data? Uh, I would assume um, we put observations in conjunction with the uh, data simulation component there. In NCAR's in integrated earth modeling or system modeling. Um, and then number two, how can cross lab collaborations be enhanced to strengthen the high impact weather research that goes along with that? So as uh, you distill what happened uh, in the first set of talks and uh, the next two talks, uh, be thinking about what discussion points you wanna bring up uh, in the breakout groups. Uh, people should have been notified what those are, uh, how they're being broken out um, in the groups. And so uh, Jenny Bolton will be uh, handling that as we get into that part. <clears throat> so with that, we'll go ahead and have Chris Snyder queue up. I'm gonna release the screen here, Chris, and you can take it over. Thanks, Dave. There we go. We can see the top two thirds of your head. <laughs> All right, looks good. Okay. So here's my title from Jenny, a unified data simulation framework based on Jedi. Uh, all the actual results and really all the development is done by other people. Um, so this is a list of people who've contributed basically to impasse Jedi development. Uh, so thanks to them. So let me start with data simulation and step. Uh, I think there's been a lot of progress over the last decade. Um, we could go through a long list of those, but I think it's more relevant to say there's still a lot to do. Uh, there's a long list of things that we don't do well with yet for data simulation. Uh, kind of at the top of the list is there's lots of observations we don't use or we don't use well, uh, especially radar and high resolution satellite instruments. Um, I think there's also a lot of scope for looking at novel instruments, uh, such as things being developed at EOL. We also need a bunch of more efficient algorithms. We always are looking to get to higher resolution or computationally constrained. Um, and we also wanna add new physics to simulations that make them more expensive. So for example, we might wanna start doing composition. Um, there's a longstanding problem in step of doing simultaneous analyses of uh, both large and small scale, synoptic to storm scale. Uh, and there's a related problem of doing simultaneous data simulation for slow and fast processes uh, that really rears its head when you start thinking about coupling to the land surface. Um, at sort of storm scales, but even at larger scales, there's a lot of nonlinear and non-Gaussian effects that we don't account for well in data simulation right now. Uh, that's a big area of research. Um, and then I think one thing that has been shown a lot through STEP in the last decade is that uh, 
often the limitation in our forecast system overall uh, is related to the systematic errors in, in the forecast model. Uh, so this often rears its head when you're doing cy cycling data simulation. And I think there's a lot of scope for bringing more data simulation information to bear on what's, on what's wrong with the model and trying to figure out where that, uh, the sources of those errors. Okay, so let me say a bit, a bit about data simulation in M cubed. Uh, so again, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last decade. Uh, a substantial part of that comes from step funding. Uh, there's multiple mature data simulation systems uh, that people in MCube use and also support to the community. So there's Wharf DA, uh, there's Wharf Dart and MPAS Dart, uh, there's VDRAS is still going concern, I think. Um, so let me kind of step back from science a little bit and say a bit about the lessons I think that we've learned from those developments. Uh, so it's, it's clear that there still isn't a single data, simul data simulation algorithm that we could all agree to get behind. There are a lot of reasons for having a variety of algorithms. Um, so I think that's something we wanna retain going forward. Uh, it's clear that satellite observations are a bigger and bigger part of what we do. So, you know, 15 years ago, it was basically ignored at meso and convective scales. Uh, but now that's probably, I would say, the, the highest priority uh, observation to start using at storm scale. Uh, radar is still important and is not a settled issue, but satellite observations are kind of a much bigger part than they were a decade ago. Um, there's a lot of things we do that are subcritical. Uh, so our development efforts are spread over many systems. Uh, at least GSI is no longer on the list up there. Um, many different observation types, uh, many different development efforts. So it would really help if we could focus more. Um, it's also clear, I think, that to do data simulation, uh, at NCAR in the current funding environment requires leveraging external funding. So um, yeah, I think that has to be part of our thinking going forward. Um, and then kind of circling back to that last point on the last side, we're really gonna benefit certainly for data simulation, I think overall for the, the forecast system, if we have a closer integration with model development. Okay. Uh, so within N cubed, we've really, there's an opportunity uh, in a new data simulation system called JEDI. Uh, and I guess what I wanna argue here is that this provides us a path to address these lessons learned. Um, and it's also an opportunity because we've had substantial funding from the Air Force to basically begin development in JEDI with MPAS. Uh, so that started about four years ago now. Uh, we just uh, began a second three years of funding. Uh, Jake uh, Liu's on the PI on that now. Yeah, so I think that's, we have an opportunity here. So let me tell you a bit about JEDI. Uh, the acronym stands for the Joint Effort for Data Simulation Integration. Um, this is led by the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation, JCSDA. Uh, and one of the infractions here is there are a bunch of partners that contribute to this development uh, listed here. M most of them are JCSDA partners. So it's kind of natural, but there's also, I think a really important addition to this list, which is the, the Met Office. Uh, they have committed to basically transition their operational data simulation to JEDI over the next five to six years. Uh, and they're really active in development of the system. Um, so the thing that for me, that's really exciting about JEDI 
is that the aim is uh, uh, development that can scale uh, with people. So as we add more partners to the effort, the development can move faster. Uh, this is a non-trivial undertaking for a lot of reasons. A, a big part of it is, is it just the culture of working together. Um, but what facilitates this is sort of a modular uh, object-oriented software. This is not revolutionary, but it's essential. Um, the development practices are much closer to the agile development that you'd see in the software engineer, uh, software industry. Um, so rather than sort of lots of planning uh, to build, do big developments that get merged in very infrequently, uh, the idea is that the system is rapidly evolving. There are small changes going in all the time. Um, and there's lots of automated testing to go on to make sure that uh, what one partner is doing is not breaking what everybody else wants to do. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence already that this is facilitating a huge amount of sharing between the partners. Uh, and we're just getting to where it's going to be possible to do I think really novel intercomparisons between uh, different centers and different groups uh, for how their data simulation is working. Um, so there's definitely a path to operations here, a very clear path to operations here. So uh, at the Met Office, there will be um, parts of JEDI running operationally for them by late 2024. The Navy is also shooting for that. Uh, this won't be, you know, a complete wholesale dumping of all the old code they have, but there will be parts of Jedi running operationally uh, soon. Um, NASA and NOAA are going to be slower, I think, to put in operations, but uh, there's lots of resources and effort going into making that transition. Uh, I think I'm just going to skip this slide. It's just the gen generic schematic of how the software looks. Uh, we can come back to it if, if people are interested. Um, so let me say a bit about JEDI at NCAR. Um, so there's this development for MPAS that we've been working on in M-cubed, uh, largely under Air Force funding. Um, we did our first public release of the code in September. So it's there, there's tutorials, there's documentation we'd like it to be better but it's there's there's enough to get started um, you can download a container with all this stuff in it and start trying it on your laptop uh, there's also an effort uh, in RAL related to the national water model to use jedi for data simulation there uh, i don't know too much about that but uh, if there are questions presumably people involved are on this call right now uh, and then there are also efforts within CGD to look at the use of JEDI for CSM. Um, okay, so let me say a bit about what we're doing with MPAS JEDI. Uh, the applications we're looking at are sort of summarized as, you know, to do predictability and data simulation anywhere on the globe at high resolution. So the interests are clouds, convection, tropical cyclones, severe weather of all kinds. Uh, I think it's really important to look at the systematic errors as we go to high, higher resolution. Um, some things will get better, hopefully a lot of things, but there will definitely still be problems. And uh, I think that's, that's a really important part of the science that's to be done uh, with a, a higher resolution global data simulation system. Uh, we're also interested in doing some kind of targeted reanalysis applications at convected permitting resolution. So here's just some basic results. Uh, this is what I call our reference system. Basically what we're simulating is uh, a limited set of observations, uh, a fair number of satellite radiances. Uh, the system runs at 30 kilometers for the analysis and the background forecast. And then it uses a 60 kilometer ensemble uh, and the increments in the data simulation are at 60 kilometers. So this lets us do pretty routine 
testing at 30 kilometer resolution. Um, and that's, you know, if you're used to doing regional models, 30 kilometers doesn't sound like much, but when you put that on the globe, it gets to be a whopping big problem. Uh, so I guess what I want to argue here is that this is a credible system. It's not operational quality. But if you look at the uh, ACC scores on the right here, so these are just five day, 500 hectopascal uh, ACC scores. Um, I'm sorry, not five day. It's shown as a function of lead time. Uh, the different curves are with different observations. Uh, black is using only the conventional observations. The blue, green, and red use different sets of satellite observations. Uh, and then the the light blue is a cold start of MPAS from the GFS analysis. So you can see that there's about a half day difference in skill between what we can get from an operational analysis and what we can get from our own cycling data simulation system. Um, okay, so one thing that uh, I think is important for STEP is the ability for to use variable resolution and regional mesh meshes with MPAS Jedi. Uh, so this has really been a very pleasant demonstration of the quality of the design of the software. Uh, basically, we built and tested with a global uniform mesh. And then we went in and one day decided to turn on uh, the variable resolution and after that, uh, regional meshes. And basically it works with no modifications to the code. Uh, there's a, a runtime configurable option to tell it, you know, you're gonna get this other kind of mesh. And otherwise the system is really transparent to it. Uh, there's some differences in the observation processing when you run regionally, uh, but other than that, it's just super slick. Uh, so this picture is just showing uh, one global mesh that we've been testing on that goes from 15, kilometers over most of the globe to three kilometers over Southeast Asia. The contours on that map are uh, contours of the local density of mesh points. Yeah. So we can also do regional meshes. Uh, and Jake has tested at um, sort of a regional variable resolution mesh. So when you run regional MPAS, Typically you wanna have coarse resolution that matches the driving boundary conditions at the edges and then uh, go to higher resolution in the middle of the domain. So uh, Jake's run at 15 to three uh, over this CONUS domain. Um, and yeah, the, the system can cycle stably for a month. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point of, you know, evaluating the quality of that very, very uh, in much detail. Okay, uh, so there's, I think I've skipped a slide. There it is. Uh, so let me say a bit about the m cubed data simulation plans. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of discussions internally to m cubed about where we should be going. What's come out of this is uh, a, an agreement to transition our efforts to MPAS and Jedi. So this really buys us a lot of things. Um, it will get us a, a suite of data simulation algorithms uh, that span everything that's available now. Uh, it gives us you know, the sustainable way to get uh, all the observations that are used by other groups, including satellite observations. Um, so rather than having to port stuff and then keep porting as people add new capabilities, it's just there in the system. Um, and so that's an example of, you know, partnerships that let us augment a smaller effort that we can afford within m -cubed and lets us focus on the things that we're really interested in um, and not be distracted by the whole enterprise of building and maintaining the system. Uh, and finally, you know, I don't know, people probably look at NOAA and NASA calls, uh, JEDI figures prominently in those now. Uh, and so this is a way in a practical sense to keep tapping into external funding to do the work we're, we're interested in doing. 
So this doesn't mean that tomorrow or yesterday, Worf DA or Dart uh, won't be used in M-cubed, uh, just that the development efforts where we have flexibility, it's gonna be focused on m and Jedi. Um, okay, so there's kind of an interesting intermediate step that's already in place. Uh, Craig Schwartz and Jamie Bresch have done most of this work. Um, so it's very easy to run uh, sort of a combination system where all the observations get processed and the forward operators are calculated via JEDI. So that lets us leverage this sort of broad observational capability in JEDI. Uh, and then that information can be ingested into DART uh, as part of uh, the analysis step. So basically that separates the analysis that's done by DART uh, from Kind of the observations and observation processing observation operators that are done by Jedi. Um, and I'll just say this is similar to, for example, the Met Office path to operations with Jedi. Uh, they're just replacing the observation processing, the observation side of Jedi uh, first, while they're retaining the, the variational data simulation system they already have in place. Okay, so kind of the final thing here is, well, what does this have to do with step? Um, it's not clear to me yet. I think uh, it's worth talking, you know, in step uh, about where data simulation is going to go. Uh, but I will say that MPAS Jedi is ready for experiments and testing. If people want to have a look at it, uh, we're happy to, you know, uh, assist new users and, um, yeah, you can kick the tires on it. So that's all I have, and thanks for your attention. Great, thanks a lot, Chris. Let's see, we've got, um, just in your 20 minute time slot, a, a couple minutes here. If there are any particular questions on this, um, while people are thinking about that or posting one to the chat, I'll just uh, chime in. You'd, you'd mentioned the National Water Model JEDI interface. Uh, there certainly is a working copy of that. Um, that national water model instance is the Wharf Hydro based one. Um, the national water model is going to actually migrate architectures over to something that's homegrown within NOAA. And that connection to JEDI is not known at all at this point in time. But we will definitely be maintaining the coupling between Wharf Hydro and, of course, with NOAA MP as part of that, uh, with JEDI moving forward and have a number of collaborations with the JCSDA folks along those areas. So yeah, we'll continue to pursue that and keep that going as well. That and that work was based off of James McCrate and um, a couple of other folks who are stepping into some roles there as well. Let's see, <clears throat> any other questions for Chris? Um, Jenny, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yes, I just want to ask Chris, if uh, you know uh, anything about uh, you know as, any outcome from UK's uh, testing of JDI? Are you... oh, Chris, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. Uh, they've reproduced their observation processing, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite complicated. It involves, you know various levels of QC. It also has 1D VAR retrievals in it for satellite purposes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they basically ported everything that was in OPS to JEDI. Mm -hmm. um, they have interfaces for the UM to mm -hmm. JEDI and also to the new model, Elfric. Mm -hmm. um, they've ported their background covariance into the part of J, uh, Jedi called Saber that does background covariances. Um, they haven't actually cycled with Jedi yet, um, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, they, they have a long view and that's going to come soon. Uh, but they made the decision really probably two years ago that mm -hmm. the right path was to start with the observation side. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, their code is split between an observation processing and the analysis system. So it was, I think, makes it much more straightforward to them to kind of do this transition than 
say with the GSI where that's all entangled and you kind of have to do it all at once. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, JF, why don't you give your comment? Uh, there's some other ones in the chat, Chris, if you could fill those back in in the chat after we're done. Uh, JF, you have something quick we could go through? Yep. Um, and I, actually, it's probably quite related to uh, Jenny's comment. Um, you, you mentioned that intermediate step between Dart and Jedi. Is it something that you feel is a viable option? Or is it something that you feel is really just in an in, in intermediate step that we, we can look at this for a while as a transition, maybe learn a few things along the way? Or do you think you see this as a, as a longer term uh, possibility for NCAR? Well, I think, you know, in the long term, it would be better to have less code to deal with. That said, you know, how long it takes to get to a point where everybody was happy with, say, the ENKF capabilities in JEDI, I don't think there's a clear timeline for that to happen. Uh, you know, it could be multiple years easily. So, you know, my planning horizon is like hazy five-year stuff that could be 15 or 20, and then there's really one or two years. So I think in one or two years, this is definitely a useful part of the suite of things we would do at NCAR. Um, and it's, it's really pretty easy. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. Much appreciated. Uh, we're going to have to go ahead and move on here. So, Xuming, if you'd like to get your presentation queued up, Xuming's going to be talking about a, some evaluation of impasse uh, convective permitting simulations during the pecan period, which was an observational campaign that happened a few years ago. to start video. Okay, here. We seem to have lost your display, assuming. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right now it's unmute. <laughs> okay, so you see my screen, right? Okay, so you need to me. Okay, start. To me is, oh, okay. Yep, now you look okay. good. Thanks. Okay, today I will talk about uh, uh, assessment of the regional view. No. Okay. Sorry about that. Assessment of regional impasse uh, convective scale simulations against WOF and uh, observations. This is a uh, collaboration work between NCUBE and the real. Okay. MPAS is developed for global simulations mainly for global simulations. So the objective of this work is to explore impasse regional applications and evaluate the impasse model performance at convective scales in a limited area. So we configure impasse and work similarly of a part of Kona's domain and uh, compared their performance for short-term forecasts in a high-resolution area. Our current study also tried to establish a baseline for future regional DA uh, evaluation of the two systems. Here are the two domains. Uh, wolf, wolf, where's yeah, wolf domain. You know, what I can touch <laughs> wolf domain and um, empaths, empaths. Why, why is it? The, oh, okay, empaths, uh, available resolution domain that they are uh, matchable. They are comparable from the uh, domain size and uh, the resolution. So here, the color contour is the impasse estimated uh, a mesh. Estimated, estimated um, 
match resolutions. So based on the average spheric distance over neighboring cells. So we were focused in the inner high resolution area. So here is the model, uh, model configurations. I, will, I will already talked about the domain and the resolutions in the last slide. So about model vertical levels, Wolf used uh, 56 eta levels with more levels near the surface and around the chop pores. MPAS used uh, uh, 46 zeta levels set to match the Wolf model in the, their model level attitudes. So the lowest uh, model lef level for both models is about 11 meters. Both mo model Models use NSEPR uh, FNL analysis. The boundary conditions will be updated every three hours. So physics schemes, I will talk in the next slide. For time step, uh, Wolf use uh, 72 uh, seconds for out uh, low resolution domain and 24 seconds for inner high resolution domain. Why MPAS use 24 seconds for a whole, whole domain, a variable resolution domain? So here is the physical schemes. So all the physical schemes uh, uh, used in the uh, models are listed here. Both OFF and MPAS use the same physical scheme. The physics suite, so called, is a convective permitting physics suite. But compared to the Wolf version 4.2, um, MPAS used the older version uh, physics scheme, like uh, Wolf uh, version 3.8.1, uh, 3.6.1, and three point, even 3.3.1. So, so MPAS and WOLF use the same physical suite, but with different versions. We run 45 days, initialize at 00Z and 12Z, uh, forecast to 48 hours and output every three hours. Verification use uh, MAT plus only on the uh, four, four kilometer in a, a uh, high resolution domain area. So we will verify up air and the surface wind and the temperature QV. And also we will verify accumulated uh, precipitation. So here is uh, 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 up air IMSE. MPAS and WOLF have similar forecast accuracy in general. MPAS have, have uh, relative, relative, relative uh, small error in the wind speed, but uh, have a bigger, a bigger, uh, a small, a smaller error in wind speed. So it's close to the observation. So, but as a, has a slight large error in the temperature and the humidity. That's we, uh, especially on the low level, on the low level. So we, we, we thought it could be used, uh, it could be caused by the old physical schemes. This slide shows, uh, shows the surface IMSC and, uh, uh, and the mean, mean error. So from IMSE, from IMSE in the left. Yeah, I just would. <laughs> from IMSE in the left, okay. So the, the, the no di significant uh, difference between IMPAS and the WOLF. So we can see it's uh, green is MPAS or red is WOLF. 
no significant um, uh, uh, difference between MPAS and the wolf forecast. MPAS has, has a slightly large forecast error uh, than wolf. But for, for, for the ME, M, mean error, on average, both MPAS and the wolf forecasts have stronger surface wind than observation. Uh, with the impasse is slightly higher. Also, wolf, wolf has a dry bias. Dry bias. Where is, the, where is my? Okay, dry bias. Dry bias. Okay, and uh, is collected by the impasse during the daytime. From this slide. From this slide on, I will talk about the uh, verification of uh, precipitation. The precipitation on the West Mountain area uh, and the East Plain area are verified separately. There are scattered uh, precipitation initiated and developed over the West Mountains and organized storms move the eastward and become stronger and weak and decay in the East Plain area. This is uh, a domain average of three kilometer, of three hour accumulated precipitations initialized at zero Z and 12 Z. The difference between impasse and the wolf precipitation forecast is not significant. Uh, impasse and wolf both have a similar spin up period. Spin up, spin up period. Oh, sorry. And the precipitation peaks appear too early in the east, uh, east area. But we do see some improvement in MPAS forecast. MPAS is a peak, so it's the circle area. I generally agree better with the observation. And the precipitation peak timing matched better with the observation. You can see here. Okay, so, so here is the, uh, FF score for two millimeter and 10 millimeter for wolf and impasse also initialized at zero zero and 12 Z. As you can see, impasse have a higher FF score, especially for the heavy precipitation. This slide shows the spatial distribution of the three hour accumulated precipitation. There's also, there's no significant dif difference between wolf and impasse uh, precipitation simulations. But if we take a close look, we can see the pattern was a ring band orientation of the impasse simulated precipitation is close to observations. I touch, okay. So it's the, you can see here, it's uh, impasse looks uh, uh, similar to the observation. You can see this, right? Here is another case. The wolf and the impasse simulation is, uh, are comparable, but there is some difference. For, exam for example, there is a ring band here. So the impasse simulation we, uh, is uh, we can see the simulation, impasse simulation. We can see the, the this ring band, but it's not or very weak in the wolf simulations. Okay. Here is the um, computation cost. We can see it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, impasse uh, use the uh, uh, CPU time is uh, relative uh, comparable with uh, Wolf single, single resolution 
of four kilometer uh, wolf. So, so we, I, I think it's a GPU version will be first improve the computation, yeah, efficient in the future. So here is the summary. So MPAS and the wolf performance are generally comparable for short-term forecast in the uh, high res resolution area we evaluated. And MPAS have a smaller wind speed area in the entire troposphere, while wolf has a smaller areas in temperature and uh, humidity in the lower levels. MPAS uh, surface wind is too strong, but the surface water vapor and uh, agree better with the observations than wolf. MPAS uh, the precipitation forecast is improved over uh, wolf, especially for the heavy rain and the precipitation peaks. So MPAS's performance could be what can be improved with the update of the physical skins. Uh, so future work, we will uh, uh, assessment uh, impasse against uh, WOLF with, uh, with, with DA or compare the uh, MPAS data or WOLF DA. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you, okay. Zhuming. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I thought you were there. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Um, let's see, we do have uh, one question in the chat. If others have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or also put those in the chat. So let's see, um, it looks like it's from Morris. Uh, Morris, why don't you go ahead and uh, flip your audio on and go ahead and ask this question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you were looking at three hourly output. It would also be interesting, if possible, um, to look at finest scale resolutions um, to look at the actual convective system structure and evolution, hazardous weather, you know, winds associated with the convection, you know, things of that nature. Are you planning to look at finest scale details like that? Yeah, we. We try to do that. Jenny, would you like us answer this question? Uh, and Jimmy and I look at uh, many cases. Um, so from just like the uh, uh, statistical score indicate, and the difference is uh, quite small. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, Jimmy showed the two cases. Uh, you know, just to uh, give uh, give everybody a flavor. If uh, there is difference, what? What 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 look like? It's like uh, the you know like uh, the orientation and um, uh, the the pattern. Sometimes uh, the MPAS will do better. Uh, so I think uh, for this work, our main purpose is to try to confirm ourselves that MPAS can do as good or better than WORF. Then we can go on to test the data simulation system. Uh, our main purpose is to uh, try to see uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what the agenda is still lacking in data simulation. So we will try to develop data simulation for JEDI. Yeah. So your, the question, the answer is um, no, maybe we will not look at more detail. Yeah. Great. Thanks both. Not seeing other uh, questions at this point in time, either in the chat or folks' hands. I think what we'll go ahead and do is we'll move to our breakout discussions. Again, we've got two main questions that we're contemplating here, although certainly other thoughts and ideas that are raised out of uh, this morning's presentations are certainly welcome. Uh, so please refer to the agenda. The two questions are, what are the requirements uh, for improving high impact weather prediction, modeling, observations, data simulation, as part of NCAR's integrated earth system modeling efforts. 
and how can, really can cross lab collaborations be enhanced to strengthen uh, high impact weather research. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I believe um, Jenny Bolton is going to put us in our breakout rooms and we'll be there for about 30 minutes and we'll come back. Uh, at 1140 at basically which time we're just going to roll right into lunch break until 1245. So Jenny Bolton, I think this is over to you to put people in rooms. So for the um, lead, discussion lead, if you click on the more, there are three dots under, then you, there are rooms and the people are assigned to the rooms. You can choose the room, you know, join, then to go to the room you are assigned. Hey, Jenny, can you hear me? Yes. Can you, can you run the room that I'm supposed to be in? I have not been able to focus on the meeting this morning with my kids doing their online learning. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll join that in a be... second because I want to hear it. But I okay. I was in That's room, room five. Five. Yeah. five. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll lead that one. I'll join so, in a second, but I won't be able to lead it right now. Okay. All right. So all right, I'll go there now. Joe, are you having problems moving or? 